hello there and welcome so in this video I'm going to talk about something that worries a lot of motorcyclists and in fact affects a lot of motorcyclists and that's a thing called a smidzy now, if you've never heard of smidzy before it's a very common term that's used these days and it stands for sorry mate I didn't see you often referred to as a right of way violation or a look but failed to see collision so as motorcyclists we must not entrust our safety to any other road users and where there are junctions and when we talk about junctions we're not just talking about road junctions we're talking about anywhere where another road user can enter our path whether it be out of a field in a rural area someone's driveway out of a premises such as a petrol station I will refer to those as junctions anywhere that a vehicle can emerge into your path at a junction is a high risk area now there are many reasons why this can happen to a motorcyclist it's the most feared and motorcyclists will very often attribute blame immediately to car drivers but the reality is it's a little bit more complex than just blaming a car driver for their inattention and in this video we're going to look at some of the reasons that contribute to these collisions being quite so common the first thing to say about any collision on the road is it does not occur because of one thing. It's a combination of factors coming together at the same time that will lead to a collision. And whilst the modern way seems to be to blame speed for everything, speed on its own does not cause collisions. But speed inappropriately in combination with other factors may well be a contribution to causing a collision. Now over the years I have had the misfortune to have to see and deal with a number of motorcycle collisions and most of them, if not all, have been avoidable. And with YouTube these days we can sit in the comfort of our homes and watch many many motorcycle collisions. What concerns me is when I often read the comments from motorcyclists about these collisions there seems to be little acceptance that the motorcycle contributed to the collision and that it was always somebody else's fault. As a motorcyclist you must make sure that you take responsibility for your own personal safety. You cannot entrust it to anybody else. So let's look at some of the reasons now that may well contribute to someone pulling out in front of you and causing you a problem. So for most of us we don't think anything about vision it's just there, we take it for granted, we look, we see, we do what we need to do. But actually the relationship between the eyes and the brain is very, very complex. And it's only when you start looking into things like, why do people fall out in front of me? Why do people not see me? Do you sometimes question it a little bit more? So when driving, the way we use our eyes is really important. And use of our eyes is like any other part of our body. It can be enhanced and trained to perform at a higher level. So if you gain that knowledge and you practice in the right way, you improve the way that that part of your body works. And it is no different with the eyes and the brain. We have a number of different eye movements. And I'm not gonna go into those in detail because it's all quite technical and I'm not a neuroscientist or a doctor. But they do explain why we do get involved sometimes in collisions such as smidzes. In driving we rely on direct vision to identify hazards but also our peripheral vision is really useful. So peripheral vision acts as a cue for direct vision. And while I'm sitting here watching these lovely motorcycles go past, I'm doing what we call smooth pursuit movements. I'm looking at a bike and I'm following it through with a nice smooth eye movement. Now interestingly, smooth pursuit movements are very difficult for an untrained observer to do in the absence of a moving target. One of our most common eye movement is called a saccade. It's where it jumps from point A to point B. And these can very often explain why people don't see us at junctions. 
So when the eye movement moves from point A and back to point B again, it's quite a rapid but almost ballistic type of movement. So we see clearly, once the eye rests and fixes on a point, the gap in between is blurred and the eye rests and fixed, fixes on another point. And it'll come back again and do exactly the same thing. The problem with that eye movement at junctions is that the bit in between is blurred. And the brain doesn't always register exactly what is in that gap. So what it does is it fills the gap in with what it may expect to see, what it may have seen from a previous view. In that respect, if something suddenly happens within that blurred area of vision, the brain and the eye are unlikely to pick up on it. And we get what we call change blindness. So a change from our direct point of view is a period of blindness. We don't notice it because of the way the brain functions in conjunction with the eyes. But that is why very often people say, can see that bike? Because of course a bike is a very small item, isn't it? Especially on the road and the further, are, the further you are away from it. So if we're aware of this phenomenon, and of course it's not restricted just to car drivers, it's any human being, it can apply to us motorcyclists as well. That can explain why we don't get seen. So as an observer, if we come up to a junction, if we move our head in conjunction with our eyes, which we, we do as drivers, if we move the head very rapidly left and right, that exacerbates that problem of change blindness. If we learn to turn ahead just a little bit slower and pick up on the detail in between, and if we can train our eyes to use smooth pursuit movements, it's much easier to get more information in that is accurate and therefore we hopefully won't miss anything. There's a lot of information on the internet about the biology and the science behind how the brain and the eyes work. It's far more complicated than I'm going to even attempt to go into here in a video. But if you do a bit of research on circadic eye movements and driving, you will find some really interesting information. So the looming effect is a situation where a vehicle in the distance looks quite small and it stays small for quite some time. But suddenly it will appear to be bigger. So many people who have pulled out in front of vehicles, one of the first things they say is it suddenly appeared. So this looming effect is made all the worse if you're traveling at very high speed. Because in the distance you look quite small for quite some time. But then as you get very close to the viewer, your image size increases dramatically. And of course by that time it's too late. And if this bothers somebody, this can also cause a bit of freeze. So if someone's just about to pull out in front of you and they suddenly see you, they're likely to apply the brakes. And this blocks your path. But at 60 miles an hour, we don't have a lot of time to react. So one factor that we must think about when riding is camouflage. So I've got a fluoro yellow helmet and a high-vis jacket. I'm not going to get into the fours and against of high-vis because I know there's lots of different views on it. If the colour of your clothing and your bike matches the background when seen from another road user's perspective, then you're camouflaged. So it doesn't matter what colour it is. So if you if you're in black clothing on a black bike and there's a dark shadowy background, you're camouflaged. If you're in high vis and there's a bright sunset maybe or a yellowy sky or you're in front of a yellow lorry, you're camouflaged. So first of all, you need to be aware of that fact. Are you blending in with your environment? Now we've also got a phenomenon called motion 
camouflage or motion blindness if you like there's a lot of information on the internet about this now I am not a neuroscientist there's lots of things that I do not understand about the human body but there are some really interesting articles on the internet about how our eyes work and about how our brain interprets the information from the eyes as a motorcyclist I think it's quite important that we have at least a basic understanding of what goes on so when we talk about motion camouflage and judging speed and distance it is much easier to confuse something speed or distance when looking at them square on now as we increase that angle sideways and we start to see the vehicles in a more sideways direction we're able to judge speed and distance a lot easier if the approaching vehicle has the same background it's very difficult to see that that vehicle is moving initially and our line of sight doesn't change and if we were to keep moving in front of that vehicle that vehicle would have the same effect whereas if we move sideways we can now see the movement quite easily so our eyes detect that movement and become a lot more aware so we can see with these vehicles coming down here I mean, visibility is great today but you imagine in certain situations it's not great if you blend in with your background and the human eye has only got direct vision to you then it's very easy for the observing driver to suffer from motion camouflage and they won't see you until the last moment which is of course when the looming effect takes over and by which time that is all too late another phenomenon we get with a human eye is that staring lack of blinking can also create a form of motion blindness so I'm going to put a little link in here for you to have a look at this website. It may be of interest to show you how the human eyes work. So the more you stare, the easier it is to lose sight of an object that is actually there. Blinking refreshes the eye and allows that new image to reach the brain via the eye. So if you research also on the internet a thing called the Troxler effect, you may find that to be quite interesting reading as well. So now that we know some of the factors affecting the human condition, let's look at it from a car driver's perspective. Now a lot of motorcyclists are already car drivers. Some like me started out as bikers first and others were car drivers before they started to ride motorcycles. So let's just look at this junction here. So you'll notice with a car like this, we have quite large B pillars and quite large A pillars. And that can really contribute, as can the central rear view mirror and even the A pillar on the other side. When you're looking, you can very easily lose things in your view unless you move about. It's very easy to lose sight of things. Now, a lot of car drivers sit in the car They'll have a glance there and a glance there and that's it and they'll pull out. As a motorcyclist coming down that road, you'd need to be extremely cautious because if the car driver is also distracted by the radio, a telephone, passengers, children in the back shouting and screaming, whatever it might be, they may be rushing, a little glance like that before they pull out because they're in a hurry, they're not going to see anything at all of you. You could easily be caught somewhere within the structure of the vehicle or just the camouflage blindness that we spoke about as well. So when you're on a motorcycle, if you've all you've ever ridden is a motorcycle, you won't appreciate things from a car driver's perspective. But vision in some cars is really badly restricted. Some cars are better than others. That's why you don't want to be lingering in blind spots. A lot of car drivers will just check their mirrors and they'll change lane here, for example. I've done a blind spot check like I would on my motorbike, but I have to look through that B pillar. If drivers are not doing their blind spot checks, their lifesavers, that puts you in a massive risk if you're deciding to hang in that area, in that zone. 
So as we've said, the real risk comes to you and it's your right of way and you're on the main road, the major road, and the junctions and the side roads are very obstructed in their view. So as we look at this junction here, as a car driver, I can't see anything at this point to the right and absolutely nothing to the left. So let's come up to the giveaway line. So this is stopping at the giveaway line. So my view at the moment, if I was, even if I was turning right, you can see that the view is horrendous. Sat back in my chair, I can't see anything. And in fact, I have to sit forward to see beyond that B pillar. So now I'm gonna to have to creep out to get a view and it'd be exactly the same as if I was turning right. What you've got to think is as a motorcyclist, if you come flying down this road, that car driver, and it could even be a fellow biker, although they generally get a slightly better view, would not have a chance. So we'll now look at this junction again, but when turning right. Just imagine you're on your motorcycle and you're coming from my left and it's your right of way. At the moment, I can't see you at all. And if I stop correctly at the giveaway line, that's the view I've got of you at the moment. So I wouldn't like to measure that distance, but it's pretty short, probably not very much at all. So turning right, I have to come out very, very carefully. And you can see there that the view I've got is awful. It only breaks at the last moment. Now I have to come out at some point, have to make a decision. That's why you have to slow down when you're on the main road. Because if you come through there at 40, in this case, or if it was a national 60, I as a car driver have got very little chance of dealing with the problem of you traveling at 60. So just because you can legally do that speed doesn't mean it is a safe speed. And this contributes massively to why we have collisions at junctions. So these type of collisions at junctions are happening because people won't slow down in the way that we were taught to drive years ago. Slow down for the junction. So local authorities are constantly reducing speed limits from what was national many years ago to speed limits now that are 50s in many cases 40s and in some cases are down to 30s now because that's the only chance they've got of trying to prevent these sort of accidents you have to take responsibility for your own welfare on these roads you have to slow down for junctions you haven't got a choice really because if you want to stay alive you've got to do it Okay, so we'll now look at this junction from the motorcyclist's perspective. So the junction is in a 40 mile an hour limit, which means you are traveling at 40 miles an hour, 18 meters per second, and it's gonna take you around about 36 meters to stop. So I've dropped my speed down. Let's just have a look. I'm gonna go really slowly. See how little we can see of that junction. Now, if you were flying across there at or in excess of the speed limit, that could cause you a problem, couldn't it? You couldn't stop if someone pulled out in front of you. Yet again, a classic example why you should always slow down when you're passing a junction, when you don't have a good view of the road leading up to it. Now there's a balance to be had here. If we slow down too much, we could affect traffic behind us and cause a problem. Or if we slow down too much, the vehicle at the junction may think we're giving way to them and so pull out anyway. And I can't give you an exact figure of what is reasonable. However, the moment you anticipate that that could be a problem, you have reduced your overall stopping distance because your reaction time is now quicker. If you just roll off the throttle and lose two to three miles an hour, you have already reduced your overall stopping distance. So that anticipation and preparation and awareness is going to reduce the time you need to stop if in fact you do need to stop. And in the absolute worst case scenario, if you do collide with something, the slower you are, potentially the less damage it will cause you. So 
So when it's on our right of way, we must be aware of all the various places where someone could emerge into our path. We've got an entrance there to the right as we come around this bend. There's a driveway here on the left. And so just because it's your right of way doesn't mean you're safe and it doesn't mean you can ride at or in excess in some cases of the speed limit. One thing I was taught many many years ago when I first started out in the emergency services is you should always slow down where there are junctions and when I do look at collisions that involve right-of-way violations very often the vehicle on the main road with the priority has not slowed down to pass the junction and that's important because when somebody is trying to emerge from that junction and if you put yourself in their situation it's sometimes difficult to get a view it's difficult to see oncoming traffic and at some point you have to make a decision so if you being the person on your motorcycle on the main carriageway with right of way are riding at a high speed not only are you putting yourself at risk you're making it really difficult for that person to come out of the junction so whilst we always blame those that have pulled out in front of us sometimes it isn't as straightforward as that so one area that you have to be very very careful of is vehicles parked on top of junctions and so along here we've got a lot of junctions and we've got a lot of parked vehicles that black van on the right any vehicle approaching that junction isn't going to see you so you've got to reduce your speed right down, identify the junction as clear, and then ride on. Always be careful of vehicles parked near junctions. They block a driver's line of sight, and you are very easily hidden behind that parked vehicle. If you combine that with excess speed and lack of awareness, it can very easily turn into a smidzy incident. So we saw how being on the main road that that van completely blocked the view of the junction and we needed extra caution. Now as we approach the junction itself, let's see what view we get. So we're lucky we can get a view up the pavement, but there's still a huge area of dead ground behind that van that could conceal a vehicle. If car drivers are careless, they will pull out in front of you. Now, I have the luxury of moving my motorcycle out in the road to get the view. If I was in a car, my bonnet would be over the white line now. If you come flying up the middle of that road, you will hit that bonnet. It just shows why you must be careful. So this road here is national speed limit. It's on a bend. At the moment, all we can see is trees. Now there's a little sign there that suggests there's a junction. Now I'm slowing it right down here because I know there's a junction there. Let's look at that view. If I came down there at 60 mile an hour and someone wanted to pull out, I would definitely be in trouble. At 60 mile an hour, you're traveling about 27 meters a second. So let's look at this junction now from the perspective of somebody trying to emerge, and it could even be you and your bike, of course. Let's look at that distance from where we first see that vehicle. It's not a lot. At 60 miles an hour, it's going to take you 73 metres approximately to stop. This is why that could be disastrous if you travel far too quickly across a junction on a bend. So bends and junctions combined are lethal if you do not deal with them in the correct way. It's no good blaming the car driver or the vehicle that's emerged from the junction if you've come steaming across that junction at the speed limit. So whilst following this bus, I've got to be aware that that bus could block the view of someone waiting to emerge from a road junction. So I don't want to get too close to it because it's a shield. It also stops me from seeing junctions as I approach. Now I know there's junctions along here on the left and some of these junctions are quite concealed so by keeping well back from the bus I get an earlier view and I increase the chances of those people waiting at junctions to see me so we often 
think when talking about a vehicle pulling out in front of us of junctions just like this one here to the left you know is that silver car going to see me but actually if you look at the right car this is a real big issue because where vehicles waiting to turn right in front of us in that way we have an extra complication if you like because of their road positioning we suffer from the motion camouflage or motion blindness because we are heading towards that vehicle virtually in direct line of sight combine that with the looming effect it makes a waiting vehicle facing us a very dangerous combination so as I approach junctions I always like to look is there any roadside furniture that may obstruct a driver's view of me I might better see the vehicle but the driver's line of sight might not better see me very clearly and of course I'm a very small target to see so here we have a junction on my left and we can see vehicles there moving towards turning to the right across our path can they see me they've got a really straight line of sight look at that yellow bollo there so I'm just going to come to the left a little bit a little bit of movement now he appears to have seen me now I've got to be careful of that one there a lot of thought process is going on there you've got to be very dynamic with your thinking don't assume you've been seen so we can see that if we look at all the various problems that can cause issues for motorcyclists such as motion blindness or camouflage color camouflage itself the looming effect poor visibility at junctions inattentive drivers the constructions of vehicles that don't help you see out of them and speed used incorrectly in the wrong place they are the reasons why other vehicles will pull out in front of motorcyclists and claim that they didn't see them so now that you've got an awareness of these facts it should enable you to do your best to avoid that situation developing into an incident speed can't be blamed for everything but it is speed in the wrong place in conjunction with other factors that will lead to a problem okay so the question now is how do we do our best to prevent people pulling out in front of us well with all the information we've looked at so far if we understand some of the reasons and the causes behind it we can work to reduce that chance happening so if we think about use of a system as we always do OSM PSL observe signal maneuver position speed look or the advanced system IPSCA information position speed gear acceleration any junction is a potential hazard it's somewhere when somebody could pull out in front of us so as a hazard it requires use of the system to deal with it so the first thing we consider along with our appropriate observations is what road position do I occupy so whenever I approach a junction of any description I'm considering does my position put me in position of safety in other words am I safe from parked cars or other moving road users but then also can I see into that junction with the maximum effect given any other considerations of safety and can the road user coming up from that junction to join my road do they have the maximum chance of seeing me because of where I have positioned also within my positioning I consider if they do run the junction and slam the brakes on am I far enough away from them that chances of me being struck are very low and also if they do pull out am I in a position that if I can't slow or stop sufficiently could I accelerate around them and escape past them speed is the next part of the system we need to make sure that we regulate our speed so that it is appropriate that we stand a chance of slowing or stopping if we need to and also approaching a junction at a speed that another road user can react to us and not putting the responsibility purely on that other road user when we think about horn warnings as we've already said may be heard may not be heard 
you know, might be a lot of noise going on in the car. The car might be very well insulated, combination of those factors. Horn warning might not work at all. You know, we hear about motorcyclists rev bombing, revving the engines and using loud pipes. May not hear that either, you can't rely on it. If you're gonna give a horn warning, use it as a preventative measure and not to tell someone what you think of them. Because if they do hear that horn warning and panic and they slam those brakes on as they start to pull out in front of you, it may result in them blocking your lane. You'll have nowhere to go and if there's a car coming the other way, you'll definitely have no exit route. And that could mean that you actually end up going into the back of the vehicle that's pulled out in front of you. Had you not have used the horn, you could have just regulated your speed and followed that vehicle or maybe gone past it safely. So, it just requires a little bit of thought as to why we're going to do what we're going to do. But it's that awareness, so like here, I'm covering the horn button, I'm already considering shutting that throttle off, going for the brake if necessary. Remember, it's never harsh, aggressive, brake pressure it's smooth progressive even if it's firm it mustn't be harsh or aggressive and firm braking should only be done whilst the machine is upright in a straight line of course and this is another reason why junctions on bends are so dangerous because if your bike is banking and you need to lose speed rapidly it's it's a big ask if you're cornering isn't it at the same time So it's also worth mentioning, if you do have a near miss, if someone does pull out in front of you and you have to take action, whilst I know the emotions are running high, you've nearly been knocked off your bike, you've nearly been injured, your bike's nearly been damaged, try not to get involved in a dispute with another driver on the road. We often see it where motorcyclists will shout and swear and use unauthorised hand signals at the driver. But unfortunately, this puts you at further risk of an incident happening, either from a, a new hazard or from that driver taking exception and knocking you off your bike or maybe assaulting you. If you've got away with it, move on and just use it as a learning curve. I know it's upsetting and I know it makes you angry. You do find that if a little bit of courtesy happens, it very often calms things down very, very quickly and it just helps things move along nicely. Most drivers involved in these incidents are actually very, very nice people. And they don't want to hurt you at all. I appreciate it's annoying when you see incompetence or stupidity on the road. But most people by and large do not want to hurt another human being deliberately. So as I say, if you can keep it calm, if you can diffuse the situation, just makes the world go around a little bit easier for everybody. So I hope the content of this video has been of some use to you. And hopefully, taking into consideration all the things we've mentioned, it'll keep you safe and will severely reduce your chances of being involved in an incident where someone pulls out in front of you. So until next time, ride safe and take care.